Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. My name is Bill Benson. I have hosted the museum's First Person program since it began in 2000. Through these monthly conversations, we bring you firsthand accounts of survival of the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. This week, we're joining you during the annual National Days of Remembrance, which was established by the U.S. Congress to remember victims and honor survivors of the Holocaust. Today, our guest will help us remember one of six million victims, his father. During our program, please send us your questions and let us know where you are joining us from in the chat. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Peter Garag share his personal firsthand account of the Holocaust with us. Peter, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person today. Welcome. Hello, Bill, and thanks for having me today. And a warm welcome to everybody out there who logged in to hear my family story. We, we are honored to have you, Peter. You have so much to share with us that we'll start right away. Before you tell us what happened to you and your family during World War II and the Holocaust, please tell us about your parents, Arpad and Olga Grunwald, and their life in Hungary before the war. Both of my parents were born in 1907. My mother was born in a small village or a little town, uh, what is Ukraine today. Its name is Yuzhgorod. That time, during the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, it was Ungvar. And this is their it, wedding. Is this their wedding day? This picture we're seeing. Uh, yes, uh, they met in uh, 19, uh, 1930 and um, got married in June uh, nineteen thirty-seven. My mom came from an Orthodox family, a very observant family. My great grandfather was a rabbi, and. Uh, she, uh, after finished um, elementary school, uh, she went to a vocational school. She was trained to be a secretary, but she didn't like it. So she went to a vocational, another uh, vocational school, and she was an apprentice in a store uh, which made um, hats for uh, ladies. Well, and then she had her own business doing that. What? Who were her clients? Well, her first clients uh, were uh, from people she knew. Actually, one of her teacher was the very first client. And uh, after that, uh, clients came uh, by word of mouth. And uh, she had a very good business. Mm -hmm. Peter, your parents uh, were very active. They did a lot of things uh, outdoors. Tell us what kinds of um, activities your parents enjoyed. Well, before the war, um, my parents had a very normal middle-class uh, lifestyle. They loved the uh, outdoor. They went uh, skiing in the winter and camping and kayaking in the summer. My Mom loved all of these activities except the uh, skiing because um, she thought it was too cold. But this picture in the screen shows that they had a re really good time. You know, I think that is just such an endearing photograph. That is just absolutely fabulous. And on top of outdoors activities, I think you've told me that they, they enjoyed dancing. They went to the movies. They just had a really um, great life together at that time. Yeah, that's correct. They had a relatively normal life financially. They were well established. My father was an office manager at a publishing company until um, she was called. He was called up for 
forced labor service. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Before we continue, Peter, I want to let you know that we have people watching and listening to you today from around the country, from Minnesota, Tennessee, Massachusetts, and Alaska. And we have people watching today from different places in the world. We have international viewers from South Africa, Denmark, Scotland, and Hungary uh, today. So I know that you'll be very pleased about that. Anti-Semitic laws implemented in the late 1930s and the start of World War II in 1939 changed things considerably for Jews in Hungary. Will you describe these changes and how new restrictions impacted your parents? Between 1938 and 1941, there were uh, three major anti-Semitic laws. Uh, the number of Jews uh, who could serve in any company was restricted first for uh, 20%, later on 6%. Uh, there was an earlier law which uh, restricted the number of Jewish students at colleges and universities. There were restrictions of uh, uh, how many, uh, actually, uh, there was a ban for uh, Jews participating in media companies and uh, leading theaters. It affected my parents uh, also when uh, there was a decree that uh, the Hungarian government uh, prohibited non-Jews to serve uh, Jewish households. So the nanny my mom hired to take care of me while she was in the shop, my mom had to let her go and uh, it caused um, difficulties to run the business and taking care of me. Right. You, you mentioned the uh, forced labor uh, service um, a moment ago. The Hungarian government established these forced labor services and in August 1940, your father was conscripted into a forced labor battalion. What did that mean for your parents? Well, first of all, they were separated. Uh, actually, my mom was already pregnant my, when my father was called up the first uh, duty for three months. And the first three months of my pregnancy was very hard, as she told me later. And uh, financially, they were not affected because my mom was able to continue her business and interestingly enough, the company which employed my father paid his salary also. But being separated, freshly married, uh, pregnant woman, you can imagine it was very hard. Oh, I, I, I can only imagine. Peter, um, did your mother know where he was sent uh, for his forced labor? And do you know what kind of work he was forced to do? Well, she only knew the military barrack uh, where my father had to report to. And when she, my father came back after three months, obviously, uh, he told her what uh, he was doing and where he was stationed. And in the picture uh, in the screen, you see my father uh, with uh, all of the Jewish people who were called up for this service between ages of 18 and 55. These were very special units uh, in Europe. They were not military units, but they were attached to military units. The government didn't trust the Jewish people to handle weapons and rifles. So they did all the hard and dirty work for the army. Mm -hmm. Peter, you were born March 10th, 1941. Your father was back from the forced labor uh, work from his one of his uh, first times being sent. So he was there for your birthday, um, birth, but he would soon be sent away again for forced labor duty. What do you know about his visits that he did? It was able to have with your mother and with you, and 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 about this. Tell us about this wonderful photograph. Well, unfortunately, I um, 
don't know very much because my mother uh, didn't tell me about those periods when my father was at home visiting us. Uh, the only thing I know, I know from the pictures because um, I know just the way he was looking at me that he loved me. Mm -hmm. I also know about his feelings also because while he was away, he was able to send postcards uh, every week and he was uh, sending these postcards and telling uh, my mom how much uh, he was missing her and me and uh, he requested pictures. And so all of these came together, the documents my mom preserved, the pictures, the postcards, and finally the diary, which my mom started later. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, I know. Peter, this particular picture is of great significance to you. It is because this is the only picture uh, which has all three of us. Yeah. I'm so glad that you've been able to have that and be able to keep that all these years. Peter, you just mentioned that your father was able to send postcards while he was in the forced labor um, battalions. Um, we have an image of one of those postcards. Um, if you don't mind, Peter, tell us about this postcard and, and we would love to have you read an excerpt from it, if you would. This is the last postcard my father sent from the labor battalion dated 1940 uh, to December 10. And I will read a little bit of uh, excerpt uh, from the card just to show um, how much my father loved us how much he hoped that one day we'll, we will be reunited. My dear little squirrel, which is a Hungarian uh, term uh, people use uh, for their loved ones, and my golden little Peter, I got all of your cars, cards, they caused me a great pleasure, and I ask you to write more often because reading every line is a special holiday for me. Your cards are full of longing for me, and can you imagine how much I long for you and for our little warm home? But for the time being, we have to be very patient. We have to wait steadfastly and trust in the good Lord. I cannot emphasize enough how much you have to take care of your heart. And if you don't mind, read um, the, the last line that he wrote in this particular card. I got very little news about my dear mom. How is she? Please also write about my dad and the family. It would make me very happy if you would write down a whole week of events as a diary. Million kisses to you, dear Peter from Arpad, who loves you a lot. Thank, thank you for sharing from that, Peter. I know that that um, must be very, very, very difficult to read from, but at the same time, I know that you treasure that immensely. Before we go on, uh, Peter, if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, share a comment from uh, Susan, who's in our audience. Susan says, thank you for your willingness to share your story. I just wish to say that you were so loved by your parents. The look your father has given you says it all. And then from Kelly, another audience member, Kelly says, what a handsome family. I'd like to remind our audience to please share your questions for Peter via our chat features. So please don't hold back. Peter, please tell us what that time was like for you and your mother with your father gone. First of all, thank you, Susan and Kelly, for your kind words. It means a lot to me. About uh, our life, while my father was gone, 
again, my mom tried to continue uh, her life, our life, as much as possible. She worked very hard uh, in her shop, interesting love, war or no war. Uh, people still got married and there was Easter and Christmas and for whatever occasion, uh, ladies needed new hats. So she was very busy. And again, financially, we were okay, not only because of my mom's business, but also the company my father worked for continued paying for him until we got the notification that um, he was killed. Peter, uh, we had an audience question from uh, uh, Kim and uh, you, you just answered her question that she just popped into the chat feature and she, she wanted to know what Olga did to make ends meet in order to support herself and her son with your dad gone, but you've just de described that in good detail. So thank you for that. Peter, you mentioned when your mother stopped hearing from your father. When did your mother stop hearing from your father? I read from the last postcard in December 1942, and the next news about him came from the Red Cross. Uh, it was a notification that my father uh, disappeared during war activities in January 1943. Any, any other details? Uh, excuse me? Any other details or just that? No details, uh, only disappeared. And that was a word which could cover all kinds of possibilities. It could mean that he escaped. It could have meant that uh, he was captured by the Soviets. It could have meant that uh, under the harsh circumstances and the winter of 1942-43 was really harsh. He was just um, too weak to march and uh, he was left behind. Actually, we do know that he was left behind because there was only one person who came back from his battalion and he saw a diary written by an other conscripted Jewish man and diary had a reference to my father saying that RP was left behind. And left behind, again, could have meant anything. Uh, this man, uh, surviving man's guess was that probably he was frozen to death. And I, I guess, um, Peter, that in the intervening years, you've really never learned any more details about your father's death. No, unfortunately, ne neither did I, nor all the people who lost loved ones um, during the Holocaust. I might share this um, little bit of a statistic, just a, a tragic statistic with our audience. Of the approximately 50,000 that were deployed as in the forced labor battalions in occupied Ukraine, where your father was, only six to 7,000 returned to Hungary. So less than 20%, far less than 20% of those uh, like your father returned. Peter, you, you mentioned a, a few moments ago your mother's diary. Um, tell us about your mother's diary. Before I uh, tell about the diary, I just want to inject a little bit of uh, information. Everything I am telling you and the audience today came from information from this diary, from the postcards, from the pictures, from the documents my mom saved. And later on, very much later on, I had a taped interview uh, with my mom. And uh, I am putting together the pieces from the, these sources. And I'm still in the process of finding out some minor details, which does not change my narrative. But at the same time, it helps me to have a good timeline and facts uh, together. Considering the diary 
this was started after my mom got the notification from the Red Cross that my father disappeared. And she started to write down her thoughts and everything what happened to us, hoping that one day my father would return and she would be able to recall those times we spent separated from him. And so she wrote down in notebooks, we, which she usually used for her customers, writing down their names and the measurements of their head and phone numbers. And between two customers' data, she wrote down um, her thoughts. And um, if I may read just one paragraph uh, from uh, her diary. Oh, please, please do, Peter. We, I know our audience would just love to hear you do that. She wrote, um, one day you will show up at our door without any advance notice, and then I would not switch with anyone in the world, and I be the happiest person ever lived. This is the only thing that keeps me going. It gives me strength to endure what lies ahead and how wonderful it will be to be together again. I cannot imagine any greater happiness. I would have gone crazy if I could not find consolation in our little Peter. I hope and I believe that the good Lord will hear us hear our prayers, and he will help us to see each other again and soon. You know, Peter, the between the excerpt you read from your father's postcard and that excerpt, just knowing they're excerpts from the diary, they are such profound statements of the love they had for each other and for you. I, 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 I can't imagine the feelings that you must go through each and every time you look at that. Peter, as, as hard as conditions had been for Jews in Hungary, life became profoundly worse when the Nazis occupied Hungary in March 1944. How did things change so dramatically, and what did it mean for you and your mother and other Jews? The Holocaust history in Hungary was different from practically all of the other European countries, namely that Hungary wasn't occupied by the German Nazis until 1944. Nevertheless, the conditions for Jews was, were as hard as it was for the people, the Jews in the rest of Europe. In 1943, 44 uh, March, uh, the German troops uh, marched into Budapest, and in a couple of days later, they started uh, arresting Hungarian Jews. And in a matter of uh, three months, mostly from the countryside, more than 400,000 uh, Hungarian Jews were deported to the Nazi death camps set up in Poland. Most of them went to Auschwitz and practically nobody returned. Our life in Budapest was a little bit different because of the logistics. Um, they just didn't have enough train to start the deportation from Budapest. Shortly after the Nazi occupation, as you, as you said, they were, the, the Nazis were focused primarily initially on emptying the countryside of Jews. Um, for those of you who are in Budapest, you were, you were uh, ordered to move into designated housing known as yellow star houses that were marked with the Star of David. Tell us about your experience living in the yellow star house. And this, I don't think this is your actual house, but it's a very good example of what that meant. That's correct. Uh, it's not our actual house, but... Um... In April 1944, the Hungarian government uh, 
issued a decree that all Jews have to move either to the Budapest ghetto or so-called de designated houses, the yellow star houses in Hungarian, they were called Zsidó houses. And, um, and we had to move out from our apartment. We moved to a yellow star house where there was an apartment occupied by a relative of us, uh, very far removed relatives. I don't think my mother even uh, met her before the war. And they were generous enough. They took us in and um, that's where we spent the next few months. Peter, um, as, you, as you mentioned uh, a short while ago, after the German occupation between April and July 1944, most of the Jews living in the Hungarian countryside, over 400,000, as you said, were deported primarily to Auschwitz. In Budapest, this, that's the period that you were living in the Yellow Star House. Life, of course, then became even more dangerous in Budapest for you when in October 1944, the fascist Arrow Cross Party gained control of the country and began a reign of terror against the Jews. Your mother was arrested during this time. Tell us how that came about. How did that happen? In October 1944, the far-right um, Hungarian Nazi party, the Arrow Cross, took over the government and our life took a turn for even worse. What happened uh, was that um, the government um, instructed Hungarian Jews to show up at the brickyard, which was uh, located just outskirts of Budapest. Uh, and uh, this brickyard was connected by railway to the regular uh, railway lines. And this was the place from where most of the Budapest Jews were deported uh, to concentration camp and killing camps. My mom defied the order and we didn't go to the brickyard. We did go, however, to a so-called uh, international international safe house, which uh, were set up a certain part of Budapest, uh, some uh, neutral countries embassy. At this time, they realized that there were many Jews were alive and they tried to save as many as possible. So what they did was they rented out um, and leased uh, apartment buildings and uh, had uh, as many Jews as possible to move into those buildings where they were protected for a while. And, and Peter, before before you moved into the international safe house that you were just beginning to describe, it was before that that your mom was actually arrested. Is that right? She was arrested after she, as you said, defied the Nazi authorities and did not go to the brickyard. Correct. Uh, my mom was arrested while we were still staying at the Yellow Star house. Uh, what happened after she didn't show up at the brickyard, somebody reported her to the police and the Hungarian police came and arrested her. And this is one of the few personal memories I have because I remember the morning we were sitting at the breakfast table, two Hungarian policemen, gendarmery, uh, showed up at our apartment building. They had a very fancy uniform. This is why I remember. And um, they arrested uh, my mom. And I was crying. I was crying because um, earlier, my mom, when I didn't eat my meal, she threatened me that uh, the police will come and the police will take me away. This time they came not for me, but for her. She was taken to an uh, infamous Hungarian jail, the so-called Moshoni Street Jail, where she was kept 
for three weeks, three weeks without being interrogated, without uh, knowing why she was there and what's going to happen to her. And after three weeks, she was um, called up to the commandant office and um, the colonel, I think that was uh, his rank, ask her if she has any documentations or reason why he, she should be released. And my mom fortunately had that document she got from the Hungarian Red Cross and the death certificate later on from the Budapest Council. And she showed that those documents to the commandant and he looked at it and mom, when she told me the story later, she didn't know what was uh, the commandant incentive. Nevertheless, he let her go. He came back to the apartment and that's when we moved to the uh, internationally protected house. If, if he didn't know, it sounds like your mother bluffed her way through that one. Yes, uh, she used her chutzpah a couple of times yeah. during those years. We have a, an audience question related to this, um, Peter. Michelle, Michelle says, thank you for your generosity, Peter. I'm interested to know who cared for baby you when your mother was arrested in Budapest. Baby me was taken care of um, the wife of the uh, husband and wife couple uh, who stayed in the apartment. The husband was already taken away for forced labor battalion, and uh, she took good care of me for those uh, during that time when my mom was away, and she was really happy seeing my mom coming back and having another opportunity to move on and and have another chance to live. Peter, you began to tell us a, a few moments ago then about where you went next, and that was the series of safe houses that were sponsored by uh, uh, other countries. Will you tell us more about that and what it was like uh, for you and your mom? Yes, embassies of neutral countries um, like um, Sweden and Switzerland and Spain and Portugal and even uh, the ambassador from the Vatican tried to help Jews by issuing documents, uh, so-called shoots passes. Uh, these documents were a certain kind of uh, ID cards, which proved that uh, the person whose name was in the document was protected uh, by a foreign government. And they saved um, many, many lives just by giving these documents. Also by having these protected houses where they put the sign of the embassy on the building, which claimed that this is the territory of Switzerland or, or Spain and by international laws, the Hungarian government uh, and the Hungarian police and the Hungarian Nazis couldn't go into those buildings, and uh, we were protected. Peter, the the house that you were protected in was under the um, jurisdiction or the authority of the Swiss, is that right? Yes, that's correct. The consul of the Swiss embassy, Karl Lutz, uh, was very instrumental in saving thousands, tens of thousands of Jews, uh, mostly in Budapest, by giving these uh, ID cards and by having these houses set up where they and we were protected. Um, he uh, negotiated actually with the Hungarian government for 7,000 uh, uh, ID cards. Uh, he used this agreement to protect 7,000 families, which actually meant two, three, five people per family. Altogether, uh, if I remember correctly, more than 60,000 Hungarian Jews uh, were saved by Karl Lutz. Of course, 
your safety um, in these homes, even though they were protected, was not was not permanent. It was really turned out to be temporary. Tell us what you remember about your experiences, your own experience in that international uh, safe house. In this international safe house, um, we had an apartment we shared with two other families, and uh, that was very common that uh, uh, many families were crammed into one uh, apartment who were strangers to each other at the beginning. Uh, later on, we got to know each other, and we helped, actually, my mother uh, helped uh, uh, them, and we were helped by by others. Uh, we didn't stay in the apartment a lot because um, during this time, it was the last few months of the war, the Allied forces relentlessly bombed Budapest. And uh, we spent most of the, our time in the basement of the building, which was a temporary bomb shelter. And um, that's uh, where uh, we spent most of our time during the day and during the night we went back to our apartment. Peter, will you tell us about the um, uh, experience you had with the Arrow Cross guards that were guarding you at the, and as you were playing? Guarding, uh, I have to say it in quotation mark, because they were there to make sure that nobody leaves the building. Also, they were there because um, they raided the building uh, every two or three days, like they had a quota and they led a certain number of people away. While we were guarded by these Nazi, Hungarian Nazis, we children played in the inner court of the house, uh, which was a kind of playground. Um, we were little boys uh, playing uh, cowboys and Indians, and we were shooting at, at each other. And these um, Nazi guards um, were sitting there and laughing at us because we were um, having a yellow Star of David on our clothes, and uh, we were uh, imitating uh, with sticks uh, and uh, whatever. Uh, we had rifles and pistols and revolvers, and shooting um, at each other was a great fun for them. We kind of got to know them by name, actually, and this was actually our luck when it was our turn when during uh, the arrow cross raid they showed up at our apartment and we were about to be led away but uh, one of these um, thugs uh, recognized me and he told to his cameras that hey guys, let's go to the next apartment. I know little Peter, he's my friend. And they went away and um, we were saved. Peter, of course, you, you wouldn't be there too long. And eventually all remaining Jews were ordered to move to the ghetto in November, 1944. We have a video question from a student, Kenan, uh, who's from Scottsdale, Arizona, who is asking you about this. Let's let's um, listen to Kenan's question. My name is Kenan McAndrews, and I am from Scottsdale, Arizona. And my question is, what were your experiences in the ghettos like? And did you kind of see a degree of community and support? Or in your experience, were people more focused on themselves and their families? Peter, Kenan's question is, what were your experiences in the ghetto like and did you see a degree of community and support there? Well, after uh, staying at the internationally uh, protected uh, houses uh, for just a few weeks, we had to move. There were only about 20 people left in the building, all the others, were led away, some to the brickyard, some to a railway station, some to the Budapest ghetto, and some to 
the banks of the Danube River, where they had to uh, disrobe, uh, take all of their clothes off, and uh, they were shot into the river. So when the house was almost empty, the remaining us, uh, about 20 people, uh, we were taken to the actual Budapest ghetto where we were let free. We got to a little park uh, within the ghetto and uh, one of the Nazi guards told us that um, the Russians are coming, the Russians will be here in a matter of weeks. Go find an apartment for yourself. And we went and we found my mom found an apartment where we stayed for a little time. The conditions in the ghetto was horrible. I cannot describe it really. Uh, again, Budapest was under uh, constant uh, bombing raids by the Allied forces. And uh, we spent most of the time in the basement of the building, which wasn't really a uh, arid shelter. It was uh, a place where uh, people who originally occupied those apartments kept their wood and coal for heating during the winter, but there was no wood and there was no coal available, so the apartments were cold. The windows were all um, broken uh, because of the bombing. And uh, we spent most of our time on the dirt floor. My mom put on a blanket, and uh, that's where we stayed. Peter, be before you go on, just a, a, a word. This is this is an image of, of a portion of Budapest that's been completely shelled and battered, right? Correct. Uh, what you see in this picture is from a picture taken from the Buddha side. You see uh, one of the first permanent bridge uh, uh, built in uh, the 19th century, bombed. All of our bridges were destroyed by the Germans uh, because they detonated it. They don't, didn't want the Soviet Red Army to pursue them. And um, again, uh, we lived uh, in a building on the Pest side, the ghetto was uh, on the other side of the Danube River. Uh, while we were in the ghetto, our parents uh, went um, out uh, during two bombing raids and tried to collect as much food as they could find. There were no grocery stores. Uh, they went to the bombed out building and rummaged through whatever was left. And they came back with stale bread. And one day my grandmother came back with a big uh, slab of bacon, which uh, was uh, not the kind of food uh, we ate because uh, my parents and grandparents kept uh, the kosher laws. Nevertheless, we ate it because um, every calorie we took might have meant that uh, we had one more day to leave. Concerning the question about community, yes, there were all kinds of um, signs of community. While we were in the internationally protected house, uh, the house uh, had a laundry room and uh, which uh, the ladies who stayed in the house and actually uh, it was mostly mothers, grandmothers and some uh, elderly men who were in these protected houses, uh, they used it as a community kitchen. Everybody who had any kind of food, um, they took uh, to this kitchen. The mothers uh, uh, made meal for everybody, even for those who didn't have anything to contribute for the, the meal. So that was a strong community. And um, again, it helped us to survive. 
Peter, before um, I go on to a couple more questions, um, I'd like to share some audience comments with you if I could. Sharice writes, thank you, Peter, for sharing your experiences of the Holocaust. I know this must be hard for you. Your story is an encouragement as well as a valuable lesson for many others. And then Gary writes, Peter, when we light our candle tonight, we will think about your father. Thank you all for uh, being here and um, supporting me. Peter, you've, um, I think, just really hinted at how awful it was at the end of the war in that ghetto. You've um, going out and having to do whatever you could to find food, uh, broken windows, no heat, uh, very little running water when you could get it. Sanitation was horrible and constant shelling and bombardment, bombardment all the time. But it came to an end. Um, will you share with us your memory of being liberated from the ghetto? And then what happened? Yes, finally it came to an end in January 1945 when the Soviet Red Army liberated the Budapest ghetto. Budapest was not liberated until the next month. Uh, the remaining uh, German and uh, Hungarian army constantly shelled the Pest side from the Buddha side. So there was no respite for us. And, um, but the ghetto was freed and we were free to move back to our home. The Russians, um, my memory is actually, and uh, that I vividly remember a Russian soldier who came to our apartment and gave us candy. It turned out later on that it was some kind of special candy, which uh, was infused with vitamins. So um, we welcomed the Russians or the Soviets at that time as uh, liberators. It turned out later that they were not only liberators, but occupiers also, but that's for another story. So we were able to go back to our apartment. Um, I have a memory of walking back from Akatsva That's where we stayed to Peter Fischander Utsa, which is a good uh, 15 minutes walk for a grown up, uh, not for a, not even 40 year old uh, young boy. It was cold, it was very cold. I remember the streets were covered with snow and um, and I saw dead bodies. I saw dead horses. I, I still feel the stench of uh, those bodies and um, but we were happy we were happy to go back to our apartment. And your in your apartment it had not been bombed it was intact? Yes. Um, we had many quote unquote lucky moments um, during the Holocaust. And that was one of them that our apartment building was not bombed out. The apartment was intact. The people who stayed there, they uh, preserved uh, everything. They weren't too happy seeing us coming uh, back, but nevertheless, they took us uh, in, uh, we shared the apartment for a few for few more uh, months until, it's an irony, this was an ethnic German uh, family and the Hungarian government, because ethnic Germans supported the Nazis, some of them uh, uh, joined the SS, they punished collectively the whole German population or German, ethnic German population of Hungary and they had to leave what was what remained from Nazi Germany. Peter, as you said a moment ago, um, the irony of the Soviets liberating you and then of course you were uh, under their occupation for, for a number of years and that's for another time. But tell us a little bit, in, we do have a few minutes left, not many, how 
how were you and your mom able to rebuild your lives after the war? After the war, um, in 1946, um, my mom decided to leave Hungary and uh, immigrate to the United States. Uh, the picture you see in your screen is uh, the picture taken out from our passport. And uh, because of the strict quota system here in the United States at that time, we weren't able to leave immediately. Actually, we were waiting for years until we were eligible for the visa. But meantime, the Soviet uh, occupied Hungary, in the Soviet occupied Hungary, the Communist Party took over the government and they closed the borders, nobody in, nobody out. So I grew up in uh, communist Hungary. I got a very good uh, education. I became an electrical engineer. Meantime, my mom was working hard, very hard. Uh, she couldn't uh, continue her business. Nobody wanted to have hats. They were happy if they had anything to put to to cover uh, their heads. So she became a seamstress. Uh, she worked in a co-op um, in two shifts from six in the morning to two in the afternoon or two in the afternoon until 10. But um, she earned enough um, to have food on our table. And um, we weren't uh, rich. We weren't even middle class, but uh, uh, we were persecuted because we were Jews. Peter. And uh, by 1980, I um, uh, had um, a very good job. I worked in the in a research institute for uh, physics. I had the opportunity to, to visit um, uh, or to go to Western Europe to international meetings and conferences. And um, I just realized that uh, the lies we heard on the radio, and uh, by that time, uh, I don't even remember we had television at that time, but all the media was uh, got, uh, controlled by the government. So uh, we heard only one voice, the voice of the Hungarian Communist Party. And I defected to the United States in 1980. And, and again, that would be uh, just make for an entirely new hour for us to talk to you about that. I, I do want to be sure I ask you though, Peter, um, did other members of your extended family survive? On my father's side, um, my grandparents survived, but only a few months. Uh, they were weak, they were elderly, there was hardly any food available even after the war. There was uh, no medical uh, supply available and um, they uh, died in um, a few months after the Holocaust was over. My two uncles on my father's side, uh, they uh, were taken to forced labor battalion and they never came back either. On my mother's side, uh, an aunt and an uncle of mine, uh, they were lucky enough to get out from Hungary and came to the United States. And they were the ones who invited us uh, to come and stay with them after the war, which um, never realized, except when I defected when to defected. Hungary and they were a uh, great help for me. Peter, before I turn to my last question of you for today, um, I'd like to share a comment and a question from our audience. Um, Dean asks, Dean's comment is, your mother was so very brave. And then a, another viewer wrote in to ask, what do you think is the most important lesson your mother your mother taught you, Peter? 
Well, uh, she taught me a lot of lessons, uh, mostly by example. She was an incredible woman. She was very brave. She is my hero. Her tenacity and her determination to survive um, was unsurpassing. And uh, I am here today because of those qualities of her. She instilled in me a work ethic. She worked very hard after the, the war to sustain us and um, hopefully, and um, I think uh, successfully, I, uh, I was able to acquire those qualities and uh, trying to instill in my children and grandchildren. Peter, thank, thank you for answering her question so, so articulately. My last question for you. Um, please tell us what it means to remember the victims of the Holocaust and what does it mean to you personally to honor your father and your mother through sharing your experiences? Tomorrow is Yom HaShoah. We will remember the six million who perished during the Holocaust. I will light a candle in their memory and in the memory of my father. And I light a candle in the memory of the more than one million children who died during the Holocaust. Many of them murdered in concentration camps. Many of them were my age, three, four years old, when they were shipped to Auschwitz. I owe to their memory to preserve their memory. I am a volunteer at the Holocaust Museum here in Washington, D.C., and do whatever I can do to tell my story, to educate uh, people, to talk to children, go to colleges and universities. Uh, our museum motto is well known, never again. But unfortunately, we are not there yet. Um, as we speak, there is a war going on on the very same ground where my father died. Holocaust wasn't the last genocide of the 20th century. After the war was over, we had genocide in Cambodia and um, Uganda and Bosnia. So there are a lot of things to do uh, to fulfill the second part of our motto, never again, what you can do matter. What you can do matters, uh, you, Bill, and I, and everyone in the audience. We cannot uh, be silent anymore when we see injustice, hatred, bigotry, anti-Semitism. We cannot be silent. We all, we all, have to raise our voices. We all have to do our part. What we do matters. Peter, you do it so eloquently. You do it so compassionately. Uh, thank you. Thank you for doing this, but also all the other times that you speak and share your message that is inspiring to me and to everybody who's listening to you today. There's so much more that we could have heard from you today. We didn't have the time. Um, you, as you said, you got a good education, but you, um, you built the first computer in Hungary and then came to the United States, had a career in aerospace, aerospace, including being very involved in the Hubble telescope and the James Webb telescope, which is, you know, just, just occurring right now. I wish we could share some of that. Peter, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for giving us the glimpse into your mother and father's life. Your mother, um, uh, she, she. She's my hero now too, and she's uh, uh, was a remarkable, remarkable woman. So, Peter, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. 
Thank you, Bill, for your kind words. And thank you, everybody who logged in today and um, shared this time with us. Thank you. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our donors. First person is made possible through the generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. I'd like to invite our viewers to join us in commemorating Days of Remembrance. You can watch the ceremony on our YouTube channel. Listen to echoes of the past, survivors' memories and victims' experiences, and honor the memory of the six million who were killed. And please join us again next month on May 18th, 2022 at 1 p.m. Eastern time for a conversation with Holocaust survivor and museum volunteer, Alan Firestone. Alan and his sister evaded roundups in his hometown in German-occupied Poland by hiding in an attic and a wardrobe before being liberated by the Soviet army. Tune in to learn about his experiences of loss and survival. Thank you for watching today.